Thank you, dear listener, for joining me for another episode of the Shema podcast. I'm recording this on April 20th. It's Hol Homed. And I was thinking about how, as I was approaching that first night of Pesach, how I was so consumed with so many stresses and worries. Business is not going the way I would like it to. I'm so stressed out about my housing situation. When I moved into this community, I thought I would rent for one year. And then after a year, I'd be moving into my newly built home. And here I am. A year and a half later, the roads are not even close to being built. We don't know any type of timeline. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Mortgage rates are going to be going up. Inflation is going up. I don't even know how much this house would cost. It's not a lot of options when you live in a community, when you want to stay within the roof so you can walk to shul on Shabbos and be able to carry things. It's daunting. I never could imagine owning a home would be so challenging because in the outside world, the options are abundant. So I found myself worrying. There's so much stuff. It just was out of my control. I'm everything right. I've restructured the, the sales and marketing operation. It's like to perfection. What's going on? Why is the business not coming in? I was so consumed. It was so hard. Every morning when I would sit and try to learn to push those worrisome thoughts out of my head. And I was thinking maybe I was doing something wrong. Maybe God was trying to teach me something Something I needed to do to shuva for. I rechecked my sadaka. Everything was perfect. He used to return sadaka to me so quickly and many times over. What is happening? And through that week leading up to Pesach, I had gotten so many great books on the Haggadah. I was going to learn them and really come in with some rich ideas to share during my Pesach Seder. But I was so busy coshing my kitchen, which I did for the first time this year. I've always hired someone to come do it. This year I said, I got this. We can do this. And as I was preparing my home for Pesach and need to stop and run errands and work was super crazy. So I was busy during the day. I ended up coming into Pesach, barely touching those books on the Haggadah and flipping through the Haggadah for the first time realizing how unfamiliar I was with it since I studied it the year prior. And I was frazzled as a result of all this. Things weren't going my way. What was happening? But then I remembered something. I remembered that there are two things that I have been praying for nonstop for the last year. One, based off the advice I got from Rabbi Cohen, is that the only thing we really need to be praying for is Amuna. Because it's the only thing we lack in life. So I've, I've been praying for Muna as an extension of that as well. I've been praying for humility because one needs humility in order to have a Muna. And I'm so far away from humility, I don't even conceptually understand what it truly looks like. But as I was in those few hours before sundown, I finally realized that is what I've been praying for. And that is what the Almighty gave me the opportunity to learn through those very experiences. I don't control whether my business is growing. I put in my best effort, but it's out of my control. Even though my job title says I'm responsible for it, I know better. It comes from the Almighty. And as far as where I'm going to be living later this year, that is for tomorrow. Hashem has that. Hashem has orchestrated everything to teach me humility, to teach me that, look, Dan, are you lacking anything? Is anyone in your family lacking anything today? And the answer is like, no, you've given us everything we need. So why are you worrying about tomorrow? I'll cover that. I just need you to know that. And I realized at that moment, like, oh, I'm in the perfect place, the perfect mindset for Pesach, knowing that Hashem is in control, I'm not in control, and that was the perfect place for me to be. But here we are now, quickly approaching the final two days of Pesach, and then on our trajectory to Mount Sinai. And I wanted to bring on someone to really help lay out our path, our steps, 
to make the most of it, to make ourselves ready for that occasion where we once again receive the Torah. So I asked Rabbi Ari Wolby, the executive director of Torch, a man that I'm telling you now that I see him so much more frequently. Every time I spend a moment with him, my admiration for him grows and my love for him grows as well. This is someone that lives his life with total congruency in the way he acts in a personal manner and in his public life. So he's the perfect person to bring on and talk to us and share us his wisdom to prepare us for the final two days of Pesach and for us receiving the Torah once again, this Shavuos. Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. Rabbi Ari Wolby, on behalf of myself and the audience, we appreciate you coming on to the show to discuss this with us. I mean, we have our sights set on Mount Sinai, but we understand that it's the process, the journey that has to be done correctly in order to get to Mount Sinai at Shavuos and receive our Torah. So we, we need you to be our guide and tell us what do we need to focus on as we approach the final two days of Pesach as we head towards Shavuos. So, good morning, uh, Dan, and your entire audience. Hope everyone is enjoying their Pesach, or whenever you hear this uh, recording, I hope things are going well. So, you know, we have a, a very fundamental principle in Judaism, and that is that time is cyclical. So, the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt happened 3,300 years ago, but today, during these very days, the exodus is reoccurring in our midst. And it's sometimes, it's okay, that's just words, but, but in reality, we have to understand that there's tremendous power in the world at this time. The same influence that was around then is around now. And we'll see this very carefully. You see, the Jewish people, during the first night of the Seder, the first night of Pesach, they left Egypt. And what was required for them to leave Egypt? They were taken from the 49th level of impurity, and they were catapulted to the 49th level of holiness 49 days later when they were at Mount Sinai. Okay. Now, we know, and we've said this so many times throughout the years of learning and growing, that everything needs to be a small step-by-step process. And yet, here we see the Jewish people not abiding by that rule of a small step-by-step process. True. Here, here we see a huge leap. Our sages tell us, that the power in the world at this time, particularly Seder night, is the power that we can jump levels, where our spiritual growth doesn't go by ordinary measure. Typically, it's step by step, small step by small step. But by Pesach time, particularly Seder night, we can jump and take a huge leap. And that is the focus that we have, is here the Jewish people are, they're giving up on everything. They're giving up, they're completely... From the perspective of a someone who is a slave for 210 to 230 years, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's daunting. It's like, we're never going to get out of here. We might as well just give up and just become Egyptians. Right. And here we have that they say, no, 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 we're going to fight for this. Or we're going to give our hope. We're going to put our faith in Hashem and in Moshe, his servant. And we're going to get out of Egypt. And that was a big challenge for the Jewish people. That's, I mean, that's what they're holding on to. Forget about observing Shabbos. Forget about observing right? all of the right. difficult, just get wrapping their heads around it. And then they get out of Egypt. And suddenly, 49 days later, which we're counting the Omer towards, they're standing at Mount Sinai having the greatest revelation ever in the history of mankind. The greatest connection ever. In fact, our sages teach us. That the entire Torah is like one big souvenir or 613 souvenirs that bring us back. It's like memorabilia that bring us back a recollection of that experience that happened in Mount Sinai. I mean, this is the most awesome revelation ever. Here, 50 days earlier, there were slaves. And now they're standing at Mount Sinai, kings of the universe. 
And they probably had the mindset back then, too, of, has Hashem forgotten about us? Does he care about us anymore? Does he know we're here and we're suffering? And then all of a sudden he just... It comes, it springs out, keherifying like the bat of an eyelash. Yeah. It's boom. Amazing. They're out. So that's the power we're in today. And people think that, you know, I may have heard this before from my rabbis. It is real and existing in our days today. We have the ability, if any of us are, and I'm sure we all have our own things that we're stuck with. We're in a rut. We can take a minute to focus. Hashem. Help! I need help getting out of this problem. I need help getting out of this struggle. This is the time that we can just break through. I'll tell you where I felt, particularly Seder night. I was walking home from the second Seder, and I was thinking to myself, you know, the Jewish people in Egypt, what was their, their main infusion that was supernatural that they had? It was knowledge of Hashem. Knowing that everything is from Hashem. That was, that was, that's what the whole Seder night's about. It says, You should tell your child on that day, Pesach night, we should tell our children that what? That Hashem took us out of Egypt with an outstretched arm. The making our knowledge of Hashem that we're, you know what? We, we don't lock our doors on Seder night. True. Why not? We're demonstrating that we're taking a leap here. We're not typically, we're like, okay, one step at a time. I'm not there yet where I have so much trust or faith where I'm just going to keep my door unlocked. So the infusion that I felt that I needed to just like drill into myself is not to take a small step, but rather to take a leap in that I trust in Hashem in everything. And we like to hold on to things because we feel like it's more secure in our hands. No, it's not. We're not, we're not in control. We're not, we're not in control. And the minute we realize, the sooner we realize that Hashem is in control of everything, He's got it under control, the happier our lives will be. It's the final two days of Pesach. We're staring at the Sea of Reeds again. Correct. And the, now, so, so we, we left Egypt, but now we're going to have the splitting of the sea in the second two days of Passover. That's what we celebrate is the splitting of the sea. And the splitting of the sea is... One of the things we say every day in our prayers is that the Jewish people passed through the sea on dry land. Because even those who say, oh, well, science shows that, you know, every, there's you know, tide. That there's a tide or, or there's a wind that blows in a certain angle and it can split any waters. That's great, but it won't make the land under it dry. And that's the extra piece here that for those non-believers, here, have at it, figure that one out. Right. Let's like come up with a theory for that. But for us to see and to see it in our ha- in our days, it means if we look in every area of our lives, we can always hinge things on happenstance. On well, it just so happened to me. My boss came into my office and gave me a raise, and so you see, it's like it was happenstance. It wasn't that Hashem was paying me back for the tzedakah that I gave, or for no, 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 no. There's always a dry land beneath it that you can point your finger at. And if you want to hide it from it, you can hide from it too. But if you want to look, you look a little bit deeper and you'll see, wow, this is something which is out of the ordinary. Always room for free will. Correct. And that's our choice, whether or not we want to live in a world of godliness or we want to live in a world where we, quote, feel like we're in control. But that's not a great way to live. I've seen all too many people who are hinging their life on their own and when things go wrong, it goes badly wrong, and they're completely in despair because they don't have their bearings together of, what do I do? It's very frustrating to want to be in control of something that you're not in control of. Correct. <laughs> so this week and, and leading up to these final two days, it's really about just strengthening our amuna. Strengthening in everything that we do. Yeah. In everything that we do, so even small things like, oh, my God, how's it going to work out? You know what? Hashem, you've got this. You know, are we going to get the tickets to the game that we wanted to go to? Are we going to get the tickets to the museum? I want to take my kids to the museum. Oh, how's They're sold out. Oh, oh what's going to be? It's impossible. And people are just, okay, Hashem, you've got this. And you'll see that it, it, it's, it's an amazing experience living in that way that we can just rely on Hashem and he's got things covered. Right. It's a hard thing. It's a very hard thing We're because nobody hard. likes to let go. Especially in our culture, we are raised under the fake guise that financial security, 
Everyone has to work for financial security. Well, if you're not going to get a degree, then how are you going to, how are you going to be able to afford life? And how are you going to be able to pay for your child, children's college fund? And how are you going to, you know, how are you going to retire? And everything is about financial security, financial security, financial security. You know what financial security means? I don't believe in Hashem. I only believe in myself. It's okay. Yeah. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with someone having a life insurance policy. There's nothing wrong with, but don't put your faith in it. Right. Yes. And there are people who put all of their faith. But now we're about to head to Mount Sinai. We're going to have a long trek. We're going to have a long trek all the way to Mount Sinai. So we leave Egypt the first night of Pesach. We get to the Sea of Reeds on the, the second days of Passover. And now the sea is going to split and we're going to pass through. And it's an unbelievable miracle. And the Jewish people now are, get to the other side at the end of Pesach. So now we're free people. But we're not free people because it says, Ein lecha ben chorin osek You don't have a free person except one who studies Torah. The more you study Torah, the more free you are. Because you realize that you can depend and rely on Hashem. There's nothing more free than knowing that someone's got you covered. And there's no one greater to have you covered than the Almighty. So now we're going to travel. And now this is the test. We're going to travel for 40 days or 42 days till Mount Sinai. The Jewish people get to Mount Sinai and then we're going to have our revelation, which is going to be the holiday of Shavuot. And we're counting up those days. So our sages tell us that each one of those 49 days is a time for us to grow step by step now. And in fact, the Mishnah in the sixth chapter of Ethics of Our Fathers, the sixth Mishnah, states the 48 ways of acquiring Torah, the 48 tools that are required to maximize life. Because we're, we can't just come, it's like there are prerequisites. Someone wants to go to medical school, there are prerequisites. You have to know this, this, and this in order to start medical school. We all understand that. You had that with finance school, right? There's certain things you had to you had to have some prerequisites. Right, what sure. are the prerequisites for Torah? So the number one prerequisite is will. The Jewish people said nase. We're going to do it. We're doing it. What, what does it entail? We have no idea. We'll find out later. Who cares? It's like imagine a guy gets engaged to his. He doesn't say, "Well, tell me what this is going to entail. This relationship, you know, tell me everything." <laughs> no, that's not the way it works. Right now, my commitment my love for you is so great i don't care what it entails and that's how the jewish people went into this relationship with the almighty we're in what it's going to entail we're here later we'll find out later it's irrelevant right now right now there's total commitment but there's a step by step by step process for example the mishnah says the first thing is bitalmud to learn to study studying is the number one prerequisite for torah if one is not willing to study, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to grow in Judaism. Now, study could be different, mean different things for different people. But someone has to be willing to learn. If you want to maximize Judaism, take every opportunity to learn. Is there anything particular that one should be learning? It should be a life of learning. My grandfather had a conference with all of his students from, from in the United States. He came to one of, the, one of his trips from Israel. And they went, they, they had like this whole weekend retreat. And my grandfather went around the table asking the students, what did they learn from the years that they were learning in the yeshiva uh, under my grandfather's tutelage? What did they take out from it? And each one wrote, uh, each one said his thing. This one said, I learned to be, uh, you know, to be righteous and to be giving and to be kind. And to be, each one wrote, this, said what, what it is. that was. My grandfather was very disturbed by it because the one thing he wanted all of his students to learn is to learn from life. Because everything that happens to us in life is a, is a teaching moment. Something doesn't go your way, it's a teachable moment. It's something that you can learn from that experience. And that can have an influence on you for the rest of your life. But you have to be awake enough to know that this is a teachable moment. Otherwise, otherwise God. it'll just pass you by and you just lost another opportunity to learn something. And it's the very reason God orchestrated the event for you. Correct. So to be spiritually aware and awakened to the things that are happening around you. you have a, I'll give you an example. Do you ever get to the gate in the airport and... You see you're flying to Atlanta or wherever it is that you're going to, and they say, flight canceled. And you're like, are you kidding me? What are you? The, here's the amazing thing. The more spiritual one becomes, the more they'll laugh at such a situation. Because 
Who do you think closed that gate and said that it's canceled? Hashem did. Right. Now, you're going to start yelling at this stewardess or this uh, uh, flight crew. Why? Are you, what, what, what? Hashem is there right there smiling at you saying, hey, hey, Dan, that's me. I closed it for you. And more times than not, it works out much better for us. If a person is recognizing that everything is from Hashem and that that's a teachable moment, they learn from every experience. So even when it's frustrating, I do, do you know I'm rushing to a meeting? I have to close a deal. I have to, whatever it is, relax. This is an opportunity for you to learn. And if a person lives their life where every moment is a teachable moment, where every experience is a teaching experience for themselves, you live a very rich life. And if you continue to have very similar circumstances that are challenging, like I do, it means Hashem saying, I've given you this lesson a gazillion times. Yes, because you haven't attempted to pass it yet. That's correct. So here's the thing. The minute a person realizes this is my test and I have to, I have to win this and they win it, it's never going to be a problem again. Right. Exactly. As soon as we're ready to let go and see that, the, and I've, I'm telling you, I've, thank God, I've been blessed to have many great challenges come my way. And as soon as I realized that it was a challenge and this is a teachable moment for me, it didn't bother me anymore. It suddenly, it's like almost like I got, I got the secret note that said, test Walby, test him one more time. And the te- you know, it's like, okay, now I got it. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. And now that challenge comes up, it doesn't bother me anymore. We have a great power within us to influence change. So step number one, the Mishnah tells us, is Bitalmud. Always be learning. Learn from life. Learn experiences. Learn from everything that goes on. And that Mishnah lists off 48 unique, special steps in our growth. I've done, I've done several series on this on YouTube and, and other uh, platforms. But the idea is that each one of these things prepares us for the steps of Mount Sinai. Okay. It's more than Torah learning, but you're also talking about Musar. It's getting our more than just knowledge, getting our, ourselves prepared in a performative way to experience re- receiving the Torah. But, but, but you're talking about using Torah in a way to harness your emotional responses, to take control over oh, the animal side. Correct. And... So everything's in alignment, ready to serve Hashem, the, the neshama and the body. That's right. And th- these are very important days. You know, it's a good thing that, you know, we don't listen to music between Pesach through Lagba Omer, to the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer. We don't listen to music. Music is a very powerful. It also could be a great distraction. Sometimes it's a good thing to have that distraction, but sometimes it's a good thing for us to just be able to focus. And I think that's one of the reasons. Of course, it's also in mourning for the... 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva who, who perished during this time. But it's possibly also an opportunity for us to just take a moment and prepare ourselves every day. Instead of getting carried away with music and getting distracted with things, take the time to prepare ourselves and get ready for receiving the Torah. Because Shavuot can be the absolute holiest day of the year, or it could just be another holiday where like, oh, shoots, I can't get work done. Or, you know... No, this, this can be a day where we actually are feeling the presence of God, where God reveals himself at Mount Sinai to each and every one of us, where we hear from God's lips, so to speak, Anochi Hashem I am Hashem your God, like the Jews heard 3,300 years ago at Mount Sinai. So I know, you know we have many customs right now, like not cutting our hair in Talagbo Omer, because of the loss of Rabbi Akiva's 24,000 students, as you mentioned, but it seems that there's like a cross current because it seems like really we should be more joyful than ever as we approach Shavuos, but at the same time, we are required to be in this sort of state of mourning. Help me reconcile that. Okay, so I wouldn't say that it's, it's a conflict because it's a time of focus. So this is a time where we say, you know what? I, don't, I can't afford being carried away. I can't afford during this integral time of our year to be distracted with other things. You know, it's a very interesting Mishnah. The Mishnah says that it's better to be in a house of mourners than in a house of weddings. I mean, if you ask people, where do you prefer to go? To, to a shiva call 
for someone who passed away or you prefer going to a wedding? Everyone will say going to a wedding. Why? Because at a wedding, you drink, you get, you know, you get excited and you dance and you, you know, everyone's like, it is, is more likelihood for frivolity and, and, and lightheadedness at a wedding sure. than you would. Well, what happens at a, at a house of mourning? You get connected to your core. What are we here for? You go to a shiva house, you're like, uh-oh, we're all going to die one day. It brings us to a place of seriousness. Mishnah says it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of celebration like a wedding. There's no better perspective one gains. It puts you into, it. into the perfect perspective of like what is really important in life. And that's what we're trying to do here. Because at the end of the day, next year we're going to have another Sphira Asa Omer. We're going to have another counting of the Omer next year. And the year after that, we're going to have another counting of the Omer. And they can just be routine. Oh, this is the part of the year that we just don't listen to music and get haircuts. And, and we don't have weddings now. And it's just like, okay, it is what it is. And shoots, that's the way we have it in Judaism. That's our luck. Or we can see this as an absolute best opportunity to zero in on what's really important. and Focus and prepare ourselves to getting closer to the Almighty through each day leading up to Shavuot. Is there something, too, as well, because Rabbi Kiva's students, they, they passed because they didn't show enough respect to each other. And it was my understanding that wasn't that they were rude to one another, that they actually had great love for one another, because that was a core principle of Rabbi Akiva's teaching. It's just they didn't show honor to their fellow Torah scholars. Is that an aspect, too, that we're supposed to be focusing on? Yes, yes. So this is also a special time for us to really show exemplary character in how we should be conducting with one another. Okay. And being extra cautious, using this as an an extra motivator to treat each other properly, with proper respect, with proper... Now, you have to also understand, these were great rabbis, these 24,000 students were like, I mean, to each one of our communities, they would be like the greatest rabbi ever, ever living in our cities. Yeah. Respectively, right? And they were all, they all, because at the level that they were at, the scrutiny that God has for each individual based on their level. That means for me and you, if we perhaps weren't respectful to one another like they weren't, God will say, okay. You know, Wolpe's, he's a, he's a nobody anyway. It's not a big deal. But if someone was a great, great uh, Torah master, and that great Torah master who God judges with great scrutiny, they don't act properly, God takes it very, very seriously. But they were the vessel. They were the ones responsible for delivering Torah the next generation. So Hashem wanted perfection. Perfection, exactly. And that's why we're measured by who we are. We're not measured, you know, we're measured by... God says, the greater you are, the more responsible you become, which is understandable as well. You think of it, uh, your child and you have different responsibilities. As a parent, you're held more accountable, You, or at least we should be, held more accountable than our children. Our children make a mistake. Okay, they're a big deal. They're, they're, it's, they're a child. But when someone is older, they should know better. Right. So someone who's more righteous, someone who's more holy should know better. They're the parent in the relationship here. You know, I listened to your speech you gave for your grandfather's yard site, the one you did, I guess, a year or two ago. Yeah. I know your brother just dropped the podcast, giving one as well. And when I hear you talk about your grandfather, it's like so, makes me makes me feel like a total loser. It's just like someone who is just operating with that tremendous level of focus, productivity in the service of Hashem his entire life. Like it, no waste of time whatsoever. It, it was unbelievable. It is unbelievable. I, I'll tell you like this. I feel like we're midgets compared to him. And my grandfather, when he gave a eulogy for Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, that's exactly the terminology he used to describe Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. He says, we are midgets compared to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. And I guarantee you that if Rabbi Moshe Feinstein gave a eulogy for the Chafetz Chaim, he would say that we were midgets compared to the Chafetz Chaim. In a way, a really sad state of affairs that we are like, we're so much smaller than our previous generations. But that doesn't mean that we should be, you know, in any way deflated or no, on the contrary, we have to realize that we have a responsibility and our, gener- our future generations are dependent on us. And the more we show our commitment, the more we show our dedication, the more we show our, um, 
our ability to transform our lives, our children will be influenced by that, and they'll see that. And I hope not, but they may say, hey, we're, we were midgets compared to our ancestors. You talking about your grandfather, it's almost like, what's the point? Like, I will never achieve anything remotely possible. How could God have any interest in, in me when you can see what other Jews are accomplishing? How, how does one approach that when you're just sort of a, an ordinary guy that's trying to learn a little bit every day? And grow. So, you know, I've thought not a few times about when my grandfather was my age, what did he accomplish already? Uh, He already wrote his magnum opus uh, book, Ale Shur, the first first volume, which is like, if I wrote that book, that would be like the greatest accomplishment of my entire life. If that's it, I did. And that wasn't it he did. Aside from all his lectures and all of his students that he that he raised and educated and the other books that he wrote. And the you, it's like it's unreal, the accomplishments that he had. And he was a hardworking man. And there was never a day off, ever. There's no such concept as a day off. There was no vacation time. My grandfather, when he went on vacation, he took all his books with him, right? Because these are books that he needed to prepare for the next semester of yeshiva and his preparation wasn't just in lectures his preparation was in his own work so my grandfather never spoke about something that he didn't attain i mean we can talk about great concepts but do we actually live those concepts or we're just they're just ideas oh i saw a nice idea in the in the in the rambam so i'm going to share that with everyone no 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 no. he had to work on it and make it part of him before he actually spoke about it and that's exactly what we're talking about too right is not letting the Torah we learn just become an academic exercise, but like you said, internalizing it, experiencing it, which is why I guess your grandfather said he wanted his students to learn from everything going on around them because that's how we take what we know, internalize it, and and bring it into our, our daily life. Correct. Okay. And this is this is the, the, the number one focus my grandfather always had is learn from every experience because it's there to teach you. It's there to teach you. So, and, okay, he was also very talented. He, he, he was a linguist. He spoke nine languages. In fact, my grandfather, something people don't know my grandfather, he wrote a book about his rabbi. He, he had a, a dream to write seven books about Torah masters and seven books parallel about secular philosophers and non-Jewish public figures. Mm-hmm. And what he wanted to do was to contrast the greatness of Torah versus the contrast. I'll give you an example. So here we're talking about my grandfather. I'm going to mention to you about the Pope. Okay, so I saw a video about, of the Pope where someone was trying to give a kiss to the Pope. They're, they're like, you know, they're standing and waiting. And then finally they get to see the Pope and they, they're like so excited. And they hold the hand of the Pope to try to give it a kiss. And the Pope, it, in the most disgusting fashion, like shoes them off, yells at them, berates them in the most, like, in the most repulsive way. And I was like, the moment I saw that, I'm like, here's a person who doesn't have any internal spirituality whatsoever. It's all external. Yeah. Because here, one little moment happened that he wasn't happy with, and you see the way he responded in a way that is completely antithetical to anything spiritual. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, he was yeah, complete. Yeah. He had a complete lack of control. People who have dedicated their life to Torah, there's no separated public persona and private persona. It's all one and the same. That's well, correct. The idea is that we don't we don't have skeletons in our closet in the in 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 the way we act to people. Well, this is the way I act publicly, but privately, I'm going to do I'm going to do something differently. They have to mirror each other. There's something else I've noticed too is that you know when it comes to Torah. We know what is truth because it's coming from God. What I've noticed with the Pope is that you'll have one Pope that will have definitive decision about a certain matter. And the next thing you see in the news, you know, a few years later, you have a Pope today will come out and say, nope, we are wrong. Now it's this way. Right. Because it's their own subjective reasoning that's drawing conclusions on what's right and wrong. The entire focus of Torah is truth, which is why you look at the Talmud. The Talmud, do you ever wonder why every page of Talmud has hundreds of questions? Again, asking like this, but why are you saying like this? Maybe you should say like that. Maybe you should say like that. What's your proof? What's your back? How can you use that proof? Someone else used that proof for something else. It's used that versus used. 
to teach us a different. Because when your goal is truth, questions, 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 questions are the most important thing. Because we don't take anything as a given. Nothing is a given. That's also another thing we should be focused on right now, I assume, as well. And that is humility. Because what you're describing when people look in the towards like, I don't agree with that. You're basically saying that the creator of everything who gave us the Torah, I just disagree with the, right. the creator. So therefore, I want to make, so you come in with this hubris, with this arrogance, and then it blocks you out. You can't so, receive Torah with that mindset. So I had it once in, in one of my classes, we got into a discussion about some, some topic. And I said, look, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. You don't have to agree with me. But if you don't agree with God, who do you think is right or wrong? Is you, are you wrong or is God wrong? I said, let's look in the Torah. Let's see what God writes. Let's see what God writes. Now, you ha- you're entitled to your own opinion. You're entitled to your own opinion. But you're also entitled to your own wrong opinion. Right? God isn't wrong. God is the creator of the universe. God writes, this is what m- is moral. This is what is ethical. This is what is proper. You don't agree with that, pr- that f- foundation. So who's wrong, you or God? Uh, absolutely. I think you know a lot of people aren't sure where the Torah came from because they never have actually studied it. I have still had multiple conversations with people who don't really know what it's saying, don't know that what the Mount Sinai experience was. And I say, look, just research that. But once you've researched that, like that this is a divine document, you will come to that conclusion with any steadfast learning and focus. Then everything else it says to do, you don't need to know the why. I don't need to know why I don't, I can't shave with a razor, but I can an electric razor. I don't know where, why I, I can't wear, you know, linen and wool, but that, but none of it matters because it's like we said at Mount Sinai, we'll do, we'll find out why later. There are reasons why. In fact, the book of the Chinuch and the Minchas Chinuch is these are two books that were written giving the reasons and the meaning behind the mitzvahs that seem to be without reason. There are reasons. And if someone just flippantly is just saying, well, I, I don't, I, there's no reason because I, in my limited capacity, can't fathom a reason that would be justifying for this. So in that arrogance, like you're saying, with that hubris that people come to it, that could be limiting them from connecting to the Almighty. But the minute one is ready to open. Now, not everything is going to necessarily be to their liking. This is an important thing for us to realize that if we want to really connect with Judaism, we have to look at the Torah and learn it and invest and any single person listening to this podcast is welcome to join us. Visit torchweb.org. Uh, join us at the Torch Center and come learn. It, it's not my Torah. It's our Torah. It's Morasha Kehilas Yaakov. It belongs to every single Jew. Invest in it. It's your Judaism. It's your Torah. This is the message, the letter that God wrote to each and every one of us. And it's our right to be able to invest time in understanding Every single word that's written in it. Let's invest it. Open up a Chumash. Open up a book. Open up the, the five books of the Torah. Get a stone edition art scroll Chumash or the, or the Schottenstein edition with the interlinear and go through it. Read the Torah. I think that each and every one of us, it's important for us to invest in our own relationship with the Torah. Take out a book. You don't have to go to classes for this. And by the way, there are plenty of resources online that people can learn all about Judaism. Learn or re- you can watch videos about every single verse in the Torah. So if somebody wanted to learn from you, because now your classes, they even do in the Torch Center, you're also broadcasting live. and People can come on virtually and so participate in your classes. Every, everything is on our website, torchweb.org. And uh, we're adding many more classes Aside for the classes that we're doing that are in person and online simultaneously, we also have many one-on-ones that we learn with individuals who are interested in more intense learning. Or if someone's a businessman, they don't have time to uh, come to a class per se, or they don't have time for, so then we'll come to their office. I have have an attorney that I I learned with for many years who can only learn with me at 6.30 in the morning at his office. Uh, okay, no problem. I'll be at your office at 6.30 in the morning. And I would go to his office every Tuesday morning at 6.30 in the morning before his depositions. Before, And we would learn for an hour every Tuesday morning. Because we're here to make it available for every... And if someone wants to have a group in their house, a study group in their house, where we study, no problem, we'll do that. And it's not a 
lecture. It's a discussion. We're here to inspire questions, inspire disagreements. That's fine. We love it. That's, that's what Judaism is all about. It's, it's your Torah, and you have to make it yours. The only way to make it yours is when you're able to challenge things and gain clarity. And not just say, oh, the rabbi said it has to be true. It's not, well, I'm not a priest. That's not the way it works here. In, <laughs> in Judaism, a rabbi means someone you can argue with. Someone hopefully you can learn with as well and learn from. But also someone you can challenge. And I have never, ever, ever in my now 18 years of doing full-time uh, Jewish outreach, I've never told someone, well, that's a real stupid question. It's always a brilliant question because it's coming from their understanding or their, their precept of how they've seen things all along. Hashem didn't make it only for the upper echelon of humanity. Only they can understand the Torah. Only they can understand. Every single Jew can understand Torah. And the greatest example of that is Rabbi Akiva. Here Rabbi Akiva is over 40 years old, doesn't know anything in Torah, and yet becomes the leader of the Jewish people and attains 24,000 students from what? All he tried to do was learn a little bit. I want every listener to understand is they have the ability to access Torah. It's not beyond you. You know who says that? God says that. It's not in the heavens and it's not over the sea, across the sea. It's You can do it with the desire that's in your heart and the words that are in your lips. Just get started. Do it. Open up a chumash. Read it. Read it from cover to cover. Read it with the commentary. You will be blown away at how practical, pragmatic, and awesome and riveting the story of the Torah is. Learn it. Make it yours. Own it. And this is the greatest opportunity, greatest time of the year to, to invest in this. Right now, between now and Shavuot, go for it. Thank you, Rabbi. Appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking Donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.